It is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Raiza Hernandez Pacheco, who models how environmental factors affect structured animal populations. She earned her BS in biology, magna cum laude, at the University of Puerto Rico, and went on there to earn a PhD in ecology in 2013. Her doctoral research was with the Max Planck Institute Oden Center in Denmark and the Caribbean Primate Research Center, um, Cayo Santiago population, which we'll be hearing more about today, uh, which is, I think, uh, has multiple connections to our center. Um, her current collaborations with Noah Snyder Reckler, and um, probably don't know this, I did my master's work at the Savannah Seca population at the Caribbean Primate Research Center. So really excited to hear what's going on down there. Uh, Dr. Hernandez Pacheco now directs the Quantitative Ecology Lab as an assistant professor at Cal State Long Beach. Importantly, Professor Hernandez Pacheco integrates evolutionary dynamics and the repercussions in light of the accelerating climate crisis in uh, different natural populations. And she is a contributor to Project Biodiversify, which uh, provides resources and tools for promoting diversity and inclusion in biology classrooms. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Hernandez Pacheco as she presents her work, Environmental Burdens Shaping Disadvantage in a Non-Human Population. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, all right, but thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm super happy to be with all of you here talking about these environmental burdens shaping this advantage in a non-human primate population. And I hope that at the end of the talk, I um, end up proposing to you a mechanism that I think this population uses to respond to these potential burdens and keep up with population fitness or fitness at the individual level too. And so what I wanna do today is that I'm going to do some kind of like a, a synthesis of work that I've done um, late, uh, lately, uh, right now, or up until um, work that I've been doing in the past too. And, you know, conceptually what we have done with a lot of other collaborators, this is not my, my only my job, um, is that we looked at individuals and we track a certain trait of these individuals over time so that we can come up with these individual life histories and therefore have some information of individual level dynamics. And once we have that, then we can summarize this into population parameters. And for our talk today, the population parameters of interest are the mean vital rates, meaning reproduction and survival. And once you have those parameters, then you can predict population dynamics, uh, meaning either population structure or population growth rate, which can translate into population fitness. So for today, we will be fortunate enough to see all the analysis based on individual level data. So we're gonna be focusing on the quantification of these ecological burdens that shape these individual life histories. And so, what I'm calling burden here are two factors or ecological um, factors that are very, very different in nature. One is a chronic one, very well known, population density. And another one is an acute one, which are extreme climatic events, specifically major hurricanes, which we definitely can have a suspicion of their devastating effects, but because they are so rare, and having them and also individual level data is also so rare, we don't have enough information on them. And so just to introduce to you uh, how these two um, factors can affect population dynamics, well, let's take a look at population density. And so here I'm presenting to you an example, a classic example of change in population size across time. And I'm gonna be using my pointer, I hope you can see it uh, through the talk. And then you can see that this population size um, across time has this particular S shape in which you can think of it, let's say from the Petri dish uh, perspective. At the beginning, there's not a lot of colonies or individuals, there's a lot of space, a lot of food, and therefore population growth can increase and then size of the population increases. However, at some point that population growth rate will start slowing down because you know, colonies are higher or larger, and then there's less space, more competition, less food. 
And then the population growth rate stabilizes to the point that the size of that population reaches the famous asymptote of carrying capacity. Well, this happens to all populations. And we can think about it in terms of the monkeys um, as there's a lot of food, there's a lot of space, there's no social group overlapping, there's time for grooming, there's low stress, therefore fertility and survival can be high. However, the opposite, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of monkeys in the population, lower food, lower resources, lower space, more social group overlap, more fighting, and therefore reproduction can get suppressed and or survival can go down. However, when we think about an acute event, um, this is an event that happens at some point in time and it can have a catastrophic um, effect, but it just lasts a few, you know, short term. And actually for hurricanes it's very uh, interesting because you can think of um, a hurricane actually what lasts 10 hours in the life of an individual. And of course, we can argue that the effects of the hurricane can last for a year or maybe two years or even three, of course, and I totally agree with you. But in relative to the lifespan of these monkeys, which can live over 20 years, the hurricane is still an acute event. And relative to the population, it's definitely also an acute event. And we can think of this, um, these two actually even acting together. So let's say now that we have uh, here again, population size across time, and we have a population which is already in carrying capacity, you know, a lot of competition. And then at some point there's a hurricane and it can go and crash the population. That size goes down from one day to the next, literally, or let's say from one year to the next. And then now density goes down, the effect of the hurricane might last a few years and then the population can go back and recover assuming the environment recovered too. And from the perspective of the monkeys, well, you might have a lot of density, but still a lot of resources in that uh, population. However, after a, a, an acute event, then you might still have a lot of density, but with such an environment right now, which is very precarious and then can have significant consequences in the demography or in the short-term demography of that uh, population. And so I don't have to talk more about this because it's obvious that these two, the chronic and the acute factor, definitely have some impacts in the demography. The thing is that it's so difficult to actually quantify because to find a system with both of them and with individual level data, it's really difficult. However, and the reason that I'm here with you today is that there exists one, and that is, um, well, the one that uh, you already know, Caño Santiago. So we have individual level data. We have a population that pre presents different densities um, across years. So they experience changing population density and is located in the subtropics, right there in Caño Santiago, in the Caribbean route of hurricanes. In the southeast uh, of Puerto Rico, it's a very, very tiny island, one kilometer off um, the main uh, island of Puerto Rico. And then from my perspective, what really makes this population um, the best place in the world is that we have individual level data. And so since the 60s, um, this population has been monitored and then we have um, information, very detailed information about all the individuals there in terms of their own name, their date of death, date of uh, birth, whether they were removed permanently from the population due to uh, population control, who's the mother of who, who's the sister of who, who's the brother of who. So very, very detailed data um, that now uh, gives us a lot of individual life histories available to study across time. I usually study them since the 70s and you have all these detailed individual level data that can um, be structured into different densities and or hurricane years versus non-hurricane years. And guys, I am not gonna talk um, more in, on details in, in Calle Santiago, but you're more than welcome to interrupt me if you have uh, questions on, about it. And so 
I don't want to spend a lot of time because our time is very short here uh, into the actual details of the methodology, but because I know there is audience, um, in the audience there are some students, I want to um, define quickly what is an individual life history, what, how we measure it, and what is the very general model that we mostly use. Okay, and so for that, so basically, then again, we have individual level data. So let's say here, um, we are tracking this individual of H1 uh, represented by the color red at time T. Let's say time T is year 2000. And then we can track this individual up until time T plus one, that will be year 2001. And so if you think about it, this individual has two potential fates. It either survives and transitions into H2 or it dies. And so you can do that for every single individual in the population, and you can then come up with mean vital rates. And those are here age specific survival. So if you belong to one specific age, how, how much is the probability of surviving from one year to the next? And of course, if you have survival, then you can also have age specific mortality, which are defined. Um, one depends on the other, right? In the same way, you can also come up with information of age-specific fertility. Let's say that here in this example, only females of age four can reproduce. So then you can actually come up with um, a fertility rate telling us the contribution of that particular age into the baby stage, right? And that is what I'm going to be calling age-specific transitions or age-specific survivals or fertilities. Once we have that information, then we can come up with our model. And we can present uh, the model in two ways. One will be one, one way that probably you have seen, which is a life cycle graph. So here in this life cycle graph, I'm presenting you um, five nodes or a structure of five classes. Here you have females that are infants, yearlings, juveniles, young adults, and adults. And each of those arrows be, uh, represent each of these arrows, okay? So for example, P1 is the probability that an immature will survive and become a yearling, and so on. And the Fs then the probability that an adult female will produce a baby. And once we have that, then we can come up with the model which is a matrix population model here, um, this thing with columns and rows. And these models are very, very uh, powerful. And I really wanna uh, highlight this because this is gonna be part of the, um, of the analysis that I'm gonna be presenting to you. So these models, for instance, with this simple equation, they are used to project populations into the future. You know, if you are into conservation biology or management, these are very powerful models. Basically, you can project the size of the population in the future by just knowing the size of the population today and multiplying it by the matrix with the survival and fertility rates. But really what I, really, what I wanna focus more because I'm not projecting uh, the population per se for you today, I want to focus more on that, the fact that these models uh, can uh, come up with this very important parameter, which is lambda, or the population growth rate when the population is expected to be at equilibrium. And this lambda is a powerful parameter because it can be translated into population fitness. In other words, the higher the population growth rate, then the, the more fit that population is. And the important part uh, concerning our talk today is that once you have this lambda, this population growth rate, because it comes from the individual level data, the life cycle transitions, you, we can decompose lambda into those life cycle transitions and ask questions like, what is the life cycle transition that contributes the most to population fitness? Or retrospectively, we can ask, which was the life cycle transition that contributed the most to population fitness, let's say in a hurricane year. So that's very powerful. And that allows us to decompose population fitness into life cycle transitions. And so we haven't said that, let's get to the results. 
So this is the typical dynamics of this population here. I'm just presenting to you female uh, individuals across time up until 2000, but the truth is that the last decade, um, the density relatively has been very high, so something very similar like this. And here and then again, a, a female's alive is the solid line, but I am also presenting to you uh, the calling um, females or the females that were extracted out of the population permanently to control for size. And it's important to show you that because all these drops that you can see in population growth are directly related to the physical removal of these females. And so if you ignore that, you can see that the population actually is increasing kind of like in an exponential fashion when there is no calling events. And then it's impossible to not think what is regulating this population? It seems that nothing is regulating it. So in a population that is completely close, in a very small island, um, what is a, a actually regulating this population? Is it density not having any role, even though there's a very large density? And so that was one of the, of the questions that we did. So we're going to be looking at density as the chronic effect regulating the population as a lonely effect. And then we're going to be looking at hurricanes as an acute effect regulating the population as a lonely effect first. And so here I'm presenting to you age specific fertility. So here you have fertility rate across density for three years of age. And then here you have fertility rate across density for four or older females. And it is obvious that as population size increases, fertility gets suppressed. There is a negative correlation here, and therefore this is a way of quantifying negative density dependence in fertility. This is for an age-based uh, model. We also did the, um, in, a, oops, in a more recent um, project, we also did the exercise, but structuring the population not into ages, but into reproductive stages which we can argue is an even better way of, of structuring the population. And the structure consisted in three classes, females that were non-breeders, they didn't give any baby or produce any baby that year, females that were breeders, they gave a successful baby, and females that were failed breeders, those are females that actually produce an offspring, but the offspring didn't survive to one year of age. And so what you're looking here is at the proportion of females into those three classes across density. And so let's just focus on the first two. So the first one here, the solid line is for the proportion of non-breeders. And you can see here that none of them are lines anymore. They are uh, curves. Very interesting um, relationship, but they give the same uh, kind of information. So here, as population density increases, you can see that there's an increase in the proportion of non-breeders. So the more density, the less the females are reproducing. And the same for uh, successful breeders. So as density increases, then the proportion of successful breeders in the population goes down. So something is happening that as density gets very high, this fertility gets suppressed. So the other question that we did in terms of density dependence is on the other parameter of interest, which is survival. And here I'm presenting it to you for each of these classes, again, non-breeders, failed breeders, and breeders. So here you have the survival of each one of them across density, and there's definitely no relationship. We did the same uh, for the age-based um, project, and there was no uh, effect of density on survival. And so we have a population here that seems to be increasing a lot. Even in a, in a exponential fashion, survival is not being affected by density, but it does affect fertility. So what is going on? How much is fertility affecting this population? And actually, when we take a look at um, here, I'm presenting you Lambda, the population growth rate uh, across time, which is the solid line. And then I'm presenting to you the dynamic that you already saw, which is number of adult females in the background, the dotted line. And it's obvious that during years of very low density, lambda is very high. And during years of very high density, the population growth rate gets suppressed. So whether it is a slight effect that, or, or contribution that fertility has on lambda, there is some contribution. 
And in other words, what I'm trying to say, whether this is significant or not, from the perspective of a p-value, let's say, we can still, with these models, decompose the effect of whether of either fertility or survival into um, lambda and come up with these details for the demography of the population. And so when we were thinking about how is it possible that density affects fertility but not survival in this population, and we were looking at literature, well, this is our hypothesis. And it has to do with social interactions rather than direct competition for food. And something I haven't mentioned, if you still don't know, this is a monkey colony and therefore it is fed with monkey shell. And so having density dependence in a fed population is even more interesting. And so we found that in, in this primates and or in others, there's increased aggressive interactions when there's high density that can either physically uh, disrupt a mating or even physically produce an abortion. There are longer interbirth intervals also due to hormonal changes during uh, high density, and there's an increase in social harassment. And so our conclusions just when looking at density as, an, as a lonely effect is that population density represents a chronic adversity for female reproduction in this population, specifically lambda declines linearly by 0.01 as density increases by 100 individuals. Population density does not affect female survival. And thus, this relationship between these two then allows us to think or have the suspicion that there is a strategy of suppressing reproduction during high density years. In other words, during a bad year, allocate all the energy to survival, do not reproduce. You know, at the end, you're a long lived mammal, you can reproduce later in life. So that's, those are the main conclusions of density dependence in this population. Now let's move on to look at the acute event and what are the consequences of these events in the demography of this population. And again, when we think about these acute events, um, they are definitely devastating and they have definitely consequences from one day to the next, literally, right? And those consequences maybe definitely last for a year. And so we come up with um, a study of assuming these effects lasted a whole year and how these annual vital rates change uh, depending on whether the, that year there was a hurricane or not. And again, this is a fed population and maybe for some ecologists, you know, it's hard to believe that this will be um, a devastating effect because Food resumption happens, what, two or three days after the event, so, so what? There's food. But remember, this is not all about food in a primate population. Of course, food is very important, but we are dealing with individuals that are completely aware of their surroundings, that the surroundings change dramatically from night to morning, and that there is definitely social interactions and stress levels that are being disrupted, and that probably drive demography. So we were interested in trying to understand, of course, from the perspective of survival and reproduction across different stages, what are the life cycle transitions uh, that are really driving demography during a hurricane year? And just to think about how the environment changed so that you have a you have it in mind. Here is the last major hurricane that, that Puerto Rico suffered. This is the center of the eye of the hurricane and right there is Calle Santiago. Okay, and so from a place that looked like this the day before in September 19th, 2017, it looked even worse than this because this photo was months later. So definitely a drastic change in the environment and therefore a drastic change probably in social interactions, social connections, social group dynamics that in no doubt can drive demography. And so what we did is, okay, let's take a look at the whole history of the population and let's see every year that there was a major hurricane uh, going through the island. And major hurricane are hurricanes of category three, four or five. And so we assumed that only those major hurricanes that actually the eye touched Puerto Rico were the ones that really affected the demography. So that was our definition for the study. And 
in no um, in no uh, surprise to me, these were the the only ones. Uh, these are the the hurricanes that have touched every single generation. My generation's pattern is Hugo, mine is George's, and now the one that goes uh, behind me is Maria. And so we built a matrix model for every single year since the 70s to 2018, the last year of, of the hurricane. And therefore we can come up with an annual population growth rate because we have annual matrix models. And this is population growth rate or lambda across time. And you can see that there's a lot of variation driving population growth rate. And one, we know a lot of that variation comes from density. We already know. And two, there's a lot of variation we don't know. We don't even know it to quantify it. So definitely there's a lot of interesting things going on in this population. Every red arrow is the hurricane year. And one thing that we can observe is that definitely relative to the prior year of the hurricane, the hurricane year, there was a reduction in Lambda in population growth rate. However, it's definitely not the worst years necessarily. So a lot of things going on here. And in, on average, this population has been growing uh, by 12% every year. So that's a lot. And so what we wanted to see is, okay, can we tell whether the lambdas produced by the individual transitions during hurricane years are really different from the transitions produced during non-hurricane years? And so for that, we did some simulations. And here, during the three hurricane years, we had um, over a thousand uh, individual transitions. And then, of course, for non-hurricane years, we had like, what, 42 years of non-hurricane years, so we had a lot of individual transitions. So what I wanted to say is that definitely a very unbalanced study, which is something that will always be in any hurricane study. Um, but still, we have a lot of information for the hurricane years, too. And then we do these simulations in which we um, survey uh, many, many times those individual transitions and end up with a resulting lambda. And so we created these two distributions of lambdas, one for non-hurricane years, one for hurricane years. And here you have the frequencies. And the pink one is for hurricane years. The blue one is for non-hurricane years. And of course, you can tell me, oh, they completely overlap. But I can still tell you they definitely are different. They come from different distributions. But actually, I'm not interested in that. What I'm really interested is in, OK, now that we see that this population growth rate during, non -hur uh, during hurricane years probably decreases, I want to decompose that lambda and be able to quantify which of those life cycle transitions provoked or drove this decrease in lambda during a hurricane year. And we can do that with um, a life table response experiments, which are these retrospective analysis that allow us to quantify um, what was in this case, the effect of hurricanes on lambda. And we can decompose those effects into the contributions of each of those life cycle transitions. And so what I want you to take um, home with this figure here is um, a contribution to lambda. And the first thing that you can see, well, first of all, contribution to lambda, and here are the life cycle transitions, okay? The first thing we can see is definitely there are positive contributions and there are negative contributions. And just by looking at that, we can say, well, then hurricanes maybe don't have a super significant effect on lambda because they cancel, it, cancel each other out. And that's correct. This population kept growing whether there was a hurricane or not. So this is definitely a, a on board with what we're looking at. And so therefore the positive contributions, you can interpret them as those life cycle transitions that maintained a high lambda, while the negative contributions, you can interpret them as those transitions that a, a contributed to decrease lambda. And even though a lot of those effects cancel each other out, if you actually make the math, the, the overall effect is still negative, indicating that during hurricane years, lambda is reduced. And we can see here that the higher magnitude on those contributions come from the transition of non-breeders to breeders, 
and the stasis of breeders. In other words, during a hurricane year, less non-breeders become breeders, therefore they reproduce less, and less breeders stay as breeders, therefore they reproduce less. So one more time, we have, um, we are addressing an ecological factor that um, a, has a effects on reproduction, but it doesn't seem to have effects on survival. And it's very interesting to take these two factors very different in nature and come up with the same strategy of the population. And that is reproduction is reduced during hurricanes. Survival is not affected by hurricanes. And therefore, there might be a strategy of suppressing reproduction during hurricane years. It's a bad year. Do not reproduce, allocate all the energy to survive. Guess what? You can reproduce later in life. And so these are my two main conclusions when we have looked at these um, uh, two factors independently, right? Um, and it's interesting to get to the same, um, let's say, population strategy. And with that, then we have been uh, thinking about what about these two together? Of course, do they collaborate with each other? And what about if the individual experiences these um, factors early in life? And so for that, now uh, we're thinking about whether density and hurricanes can uh, uh, work as early life adversity. And we define early life adversity as the period in which the individual was either in utero or an infant. And so if an individual, in this case females, were in utero or as infant when either of these major hurricanes hit, then that was attributed as a cohort, um, as a hurricane cohort. And we also um, included density at birth as another potential adversity in the list of adversities in these cohorts. And so basically here we're uh, looking at whether population density at birth and or these two guys here early in life actually can predict reproduction later in life. We know they affect reproduction at the average level if an individual um, experiences it that year, but we don't know what happens if the individual just experiences as a baby or during gestation. And so I only say these two guys because um, Hurricane Maria was in 2017 and we still don't have the complete individual life histories of those females. They are just turning three um, this year. So we will have to wait a lot for that, but we do have complete reproductive life histories for females being born during these two years, 89 and 98. And so here we wanted to um, answer whether these early life adversities affect late life reproduction, specifically by looking at age specific fertility for the cohort hurricane and the non cohort, I'm sorry, the hurricane cohort and the non hurricane cohort, whether that adversity may affect interbirth interval in terms of like a measurement of pace of reproduction. And especially knowing whether the females undergoing this adversity um, would have an affected lifetime reproductive success as our measurement of individual fitness. And guys, this is the point in which um, I am no longer talking about matrix models, therefore I'm no longer in my comfort zone. And this is the first time I'm gonna show this to anyone. So please pay attention and I'll be more than happy to, to hear thoughts, suggestions and questions, okay? So this is definitely new and not published yet. All right, so for these, um, we decided to use generalized additive mixed models uh, to model um, age specific fertility. And why is that? Because we know that fertility across age is definitely not linear. And we wanted to use a model that would allow us that facility in, in interpreting these curves or this freedom, right? And so we build up um, competitive models that included the fixed effect of whether you experience a cohort, um, a hurricane or not. Uh, we also uh, included the fixed effect of density at birth. And we also included the interaction of cohort type with age. 
and all the combinations uh, among that. And this is the, the, the prediction for the most supported model, which is the one that includes the cohort type as an interaction with age and also density as a, as a smooth effect. And here, guys, if you ignore right now the colors for the uh, cohort type, this is the typical expected shape of fertility across age, no surprise. But once we have the evidence to say that the cohorts uh, have different curves across age is when this becomes very interesting. So the first thing I want you to, to take a look uh, in the pattern here is the maturity or that early age. Most, uh, some females in this population start reproducing at three years of age. Most of them do at four and five. But look at this. So the mean fertility at age three is much higher for the non-cohort hurricane than for the hurricane cohort. Suggesting a little bit of a delay in sexual maturity if you experience a hurricane and a certain density early in life. That to me was not very surprising. I would have said that just by my general knowledge of life history trade-offs. But what is really, really interesting to me is this other pattern. So for those females, experiencing this delay in maturity, then there's a full compensation during prime ages in fertility in which they present a higher mean fertility. For the females of the non cohort hurricane, which started reproducing earlier on average, they present a lower mean fertility during prime ages. And this to me was definitely unexpected. And so we said, okay, let's take a look really at the age at first birth of these females and let's see really what's going on. And guys, this is empirical data, not a model. And here is the age at first birth or the onset of sexual maturity for these females uh, divided into whether they experience a hurricane early in life or not. And definitely if, if we looked and focused on that first age there's definitely a delay in a maturity if you experience a hurricane. And so these are the, the medians of age at first birth. And so we said, okay, uh, this, this is interesting. Um, there's definitely a delay. If you receive that huge trauma early in life, it means that, yeah, they can, it makes sense to think that there's gonna be a certain delay. Now let's take a look at interbirth interval. And the reason to take a look at interbirth interval is that it not only it, it defines the pace of reproduction too, definitely. And I would have predicted that um, for a female undergoing trauma early in life, it might not have the more optimal either physiology or pace of reproduction. And therefore, I would have predicted um, larger interbirth intervals. And this is again empirical data. Here, interbirth interval across ages for the hurricane and the non hurricane cohort, but we didn't find any evidence that these actual two cohort types are different. I'm just presenting them to you to, just to see. Um, we find slight difference that density at birth could affect um, interbirth interval, um, but it was very weak um, or very poorly fitted model, so I'm not very happy with it. So, no evidence uh, or solid evidence that cohort type. Uh, or, or experiencing early life adversity affects interbirth intervals. And so the last thing that we were looking at, okay, then definitely some um, contribution to uh, mean age specific fertility, not so much contribution to the pace of that fertility. Now let's take a look at how this ends up in terms of lifetime reproductive success. And I'm going to present to you two ways in which um, a lifetime reproductive success can be defined. So the first way I'm gonna to present to you is a way that um, assumes that the early survival of the baby or the fitness of the, of the offspring does not belong to the mother. In other words, I am defining lifetime reproductive success as the total number of offspring produced by each female, no matter whether that offspring reached maturity, reproduced, nothing. So if we do that, 
here is lifetime reproductive success across cohorts, they definitely, those distributions overlap a little bit. And then you can say that there's definitely more lifetime reproductive success in terms of that medium for the hurricane cohort than from the non-hurricane cohort, which uh, is it's not surprising because if they indeed reproduce with a higher probability during prime ages, they definitely produce more babies. Now, I don't think this is entirely the, the way to go with this population because I understand that the mother really um, has a major role in the early fitness of that baby. So I am going to assume that the fitness in the early life of the, of the offspring really depends on the mother. And therefore I am going to attribute that fitness to the mother's fitness. In other words, I am going to define lifetime reproductive success as the number of offspring produced by an, in a female, but the offspring that survive, uh, survive until maturity. And when I do that, there's no difference whatsoever in terms of lifetime reproductive success. So my proposition today is that this inverted relationship um, works as a mechanism to say, okay, for those having early life adversity, there's going to be a delay in maturity, but you can compensate later in life so that at the end, those females with adversity or those disadvantaged females can still reach the expected lifetime reproductive success as if they were females that are not disadvantaged. And so the conclusions for these is um, early life adversity delays maturity. Females experiencing early life adversity show higher mean fertility in prime ages. There's no difference in lifetime reproductive success among females with adversity and no adversity early in life. And my proposition, life history trade-offs serve as a potential mechanism balancing delays in maturity and age-specific fertility in prime ages in order to yield similar lifetime reproductive success. Another thing that we can definitely take from all this uh, analysis is that as long as survival is not affected, the population will continue to grow. And that demonstrates the unbalanced contribution of fertility and survival to lambda, to population fitness in long-lived mammals. And that's all for today, but I do have um, a future directions that I thought I was not able to talk to you about, but that's more, even more exciting. So um, actually, I, um, uh, Kathy, I think I, she mentioned it. I have um, plans for, for uh, looking at adversity uh, and in terms of uh, individual health histories. And that's gonna be uh, partly in collaboration with NOAA's group. Um, so let me talk to you a little bit about that before I'll go into the questions. All right, so uh, 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 we can say that health disparities across the groups are defined by gender, race, or ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and uh, result in earlier death uh, of disadvantaged persons. And so I think um, these racist macaques are a great system to develop models um, uh, to understand socially driven health inequality dynamics. And so let me tell you what I'm thinking here, or the rationale that we have here. So when you look at the literature um, uh, quantifying health gaps between disadvantaged people or advantaged people, usually what we see is something like this, in which you see a trajectory of health penalties across age, and you see um, one of those trajectories belongs to socially disadvantaged people, let's say black, Latino, or low income people, and then another trajectory, the contrast one, would be the socially advantaged people, let's say white people or high income, especially in the United States. And usually what we can see with these um, health trajectories is that um, they have different baseline measures of health, meaning different y-intercepts. So in this case, you start this um, journey or this study, if you want, with a socially disadvantaged group that has already higher penalties. Um, however, a lot of these studies conclude that they do still have the same slope. 
In other words, even though these are two groups with different baseline measures of health, they still present the same health change over time. And this is surprising, especially when you know that disadvantaged people usually um, experience earlier death. So how is it possible for two groups with different baseline measures of health, one that has shorter lifespan than the other, present the same health change over time? The other um, usual thing that we observe um, oops, will be a relationship like this, in which you have, again, very different baseline measures of health across these groups, but they, as they get older, they will converge into something similar in terms of health penalties. And for that, what you observe is that this slope or rates of change actually are not uh, equal. So for the socially disadvantaged group, what has been also reported is that the pace or the rate of change in those health trajectories are lower. However, for the advantage group, the rate of change is higher, making these health trajectories more similar in terms of, of number of penalties at some point in life. And still to me, this, um, my suspicion here is that these linear models have the constraint of linearity and therefore that is keeping us away of really coming up with accurate measures of health or gap in health of these two social, uh, socially advantaged and disadvantaged groups. So what we're trying to say is, well, we have a perfect system that has social, uh, social stratification and therefore we can define advantage and disadvantage among individuals. We have a system that uh, will not have attrition. We will know the fate of every individual. There's not going to be any um, missingness in data. So we have the perfect analogy to at least parameterize or actually develop a model that may be later than we can use for um, a human data. But the special part of this model is that it's not going to be constrained by linearity. And for that, what we are proposing is to actually not use uh, growth curve models, which are widely used in these studies, but to use matrix models, multi-stage models, which actually will come up with no constraints in linearity. If the trajectories are linear, the matrix models will tell us. But if they're not, these models are not going to be constrained by that. And actually, we will be able to more accurately define gaps in health when those gaps occur. And you're going to see a dynamic between those gaps in health across age. So maybe some ages, the gap is higher. Maybe other ages, the gap is no so large. And something that is very important for these models that um, the linear models don't take into account is the fact that there can be recovery, there can be stasis. So if you structure your population into um, health states and you study the dynamics of this transition between those health states, you will be able to quantify the ages in which these gaps start coming up or the ages in which actually recovery is more possible. And so I'm super happy to finish talking about this. I thought I didn't have time and I'm very grateful to have um, collaborators like Noah uh, to, to come up with this journey that will bring me back to the field and not in front of the computer so much. So thank you so much. I'm more than happy to um, take some questions. And of course, this is not all about me. A lot of people involved, special thanks to undergraduate students generating a lot of this data, Dana Morcello and Logan Luevano. And Angie and Giselle in Cayo Santiago, Noah for inviting me and for supporting my research and a lot of other collaborations. Uh, and of course, the University of Puerto Rico, always in my heart, Long Beach and Richmond. Thank you so much, guys. All right, that was uh, fantastic. And um, while other people are gathering themselves for questions, I'm gonna jump in um, as a facilitator and ask the first one. Um, 
And that was, I'm quite curious about what we know of the characteristics of the females that are able to, that, that are stay breeders in the wake of a hurricane or who move from non-breeder to breeder in the wake of a hurricane. So are they, are they, do they face the fewest trade-offs because of certain aspects of condition or rank or um, time since last pregnancy or such that, that they're able to, to reproduce in the wake of a hurricane and then might then their offspring, because they're growing up with that early life adversity, they're doing worse than that type of kiddo would be doing um, if they were born to that same type of mother in a non-hurricane year. So that's, sorry, that's a, several questions. I, 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 think, I think I got it. Um, okay. and, and of course is, I don't know. Um, no, so, uh, so first of all, I think you were talking about maybe like fixed uh, biotic effects like genes. Do, do these females are special in some way, let's say about genes? Um, I have no idea and actually, um, I often argue that genes. I'm not talking about genes. Okay, I'm talking okay, about they were heavier, higher rank, more socially integrated, um, things like that. So we don't know. I mean, I haven't looked at that. Um, of course, we want to uh, integrate a social ranking and social inter a integration to this uh, last uh, project that I was presenting that hopefully I can do with some collaboration with NOAA. But we don't know, actually, I haven't looked at whether there's a, a relationship with the matri line membership, for instance, concerning uh, uh, the individual that we're looking at. Um, so no, that's something to, to I really don't know. And then um, the other thing that I think you were uh, mentioning is that um, one thing I definitely want to do is to measure whether the offspring of this, whether they are advantaged or disadvantaged females, follow the same uh, trajectory of those females. So does that burden or individual trajectory is inherited in some way? But still, this is completely new, so we don't know yet. All right. Thank you. Uh, great talk. So presumably those macaques that had the early life adversity from hurricanes were trading off growth and immune function against early first reproduction. Do you have any growth data or final adult height for those animals that could like strengthen your argument and, you know, show a classic life history trade-off? Did you say like uh, physiological data? Yeah, like, like height or weight or anything like that? No, 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 no. Everything comes from the demographic data. Um, so again, no, nothing on that. But there's people actually with that data uh, right now with the Hurricane Maria. So that's something definitely that can be done in the future. So NOAA's group with other collaborators are uh, taking um, physiological data for these uh, individuals even before I think and after the Hurricane Maria. So that's part of their project, definitely. So I'll be more than happy to contribute with demography there. Oh. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, actually, I have a, a couple questions. Uh, first off, when you're going, when you showed us that graph with like the fertil like fertility as a function of population density, it seems like fertility at first increases from low density to mid density, and then it decreases again. Again, is that as it goes into high density? Could that initial Increased be because females are having a harder time finding a, finding a suitable mate. And the second question, like, could one thing, thing that's keeping them from mating at high density is just that they're more stress, stressed or they don't have the hormonal balance or the fat levels necessary to, to reproduce? Yeah, so for the first question, um, it's interesting because it depends how you structure the population, how you build your model. So when we did it for the first time, we did a, a model that was based on ages. So we looked at fertility for each age and then we regressed it against density and we can see a complete linear uh, regression there that says, okay, for every increase of density, fertility is going to decrease by this rate, right? When we do uh, the structure of the, of the population and ignoring completely age, we just say, okay, we're going to classify adults depending on their reproductive performance this year. Then you can see this other, even more interesting, we can argue, uh, relationship. And as you say, of course, it could be um, a matter of either density 
effect is very weak at the beginning and it really is meaningless, or it could be a, an opposite effect of density, as you mentioned, that very, very low um, uh, density, very low overlap of, of, of groups, maybe even less extra group mating. So of course, fertility might be low too. So those are two possibilities. For the second uh, question, do I remember it? Can you repeat it? Uh, what, what could be causing? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, um, so from the ecological perspective of density dependence, it, we will always think it's low resources, meaning low food, especially, right? So in this particular population, that argument is very weak because they are fed, mm -hmm. right? And therefore, um, we opt to hypothesize is completely a behavioral thing that then affects physiology, meaning mm -hmm. that there's more vigilance maybe, or there's more actual disruption of mating. So you actually, as an individual, might not have access to a particular uh, uh, individual to mate, and therefore fertility goes down. There can also be uh, hormonal changes apparently, or there can also be, um, any other constraint um, uh, produced by high density that provokes abortions or more stillbirth. Unfortunately, data on that is not very rich in Cayo in terms of abortions or stillbirth. So that's something that we won't be able to look at to actually try to define the mechanism behind that density dependence. Oh, thank you. Um, so uh, any other questions? Like I have a million questions, so I'm, I, I should mute myself, but. Yeah, we do have one. Um, Marina. Yeah, hi. So first of all, great talk and thank you so much. Um, so I was curious, and I should probably know this, but I was wondering if females from the same match line, so if like sisters have similar reproductive strategies, and then if you guys have looked at any sisters and seen, the, you know, of course, the ones who go through the hurricane, the ones who don't, if you still see the pattern that you showed. I'm gonna start writing down all this. Um, I have projects for the, for the following 10 years. No, I haven't looked in, no, in any of my projects. I haven't looked at a matriline actually, um, but that's a great question. And it's, again, it's a matter of what, it, what is the mechanism behind it? I'm one of those uh, population ecologists that like to think that it's all about stochasticity rather than fixed biological traits, um, but definitely it's a, it's a great question whether sisters or whether there is a family component that is driving a little bit of these um, life histories, but I really don't know. Thanks. All right. Um, you don't have to write anything down because all of this is being recorded. And, <laughs> oh, I forgot. <laughs> um, and so uh, we're now at one o'clock. So everybody, please join me in another round of applause for Professor Hernandez Pacheco. Thank you so much, guys.